Tonight, we're going to talk about water-wise gardening. Um, and uh, I don't do any talks anymore that don't come with a little bit of background in education. So you're going to have to bear with me because I think this is very important to the process. When we're talking about water-wise uh, gardening, a term you might hear, and it has been used uh, a fair amount, is xeriscape. Uh, it's a term that actually the folks in the Southwest who have had to deal with water issues, uh, that, you know, for for a very very long period of time, all xeriscape means is the practice of landscaping with minimal use of water. Uh, we don't use that as much now as a term because a lot of people don't know what it means. We're really trying to get people to understand uh, water usage, the issues that we are currently facing. So the term water-wise has been um, um, quite popular, and, that, and that's the word we'll be using. But I did want you to know that if you hear, hear that word xeriscape, uh, that's exactly what it means. So the obviously the easiest process um, uh, for doing water-wise gardening is your plant selection. And no, we're not going to talk plants. I don't do the talks anymore where the entire talk is just this long list of plants. Lots of people out there who can do that. Many, many resources uh, that can tell you which plants to use according to where you live. Um, but that, of course, is the first and foremost thing that you're going to look at. Unfortunately, and this is where the education is going to come in, that tends to be all a gardener looks at is just the plant selection. And it goes much deeper than that. Let me uh, explain what I'm talking about. As I said, we're going to do a little bit of background here. The first that I want to discuss, and I still find people are so confused about, is the zone, and uh, in particular, what zone you are in. Whether you're talking xeriscaping or any other form of gardening, the, the public's, the home gardener's perception is that the zone is almost like the single uh, most important uh, uh, criteria for whether a plant is going to survive. It is an important criteria, but somehow, um, it, whether in our marketing or however we've been selling plants, I think we've really confused the public as far as just exactly what zone means. And I think you'll understand because right now I'm sure you're all looking at your catalogs and all of you are looking for zone five, likely zone five plants. And your perception is because this catalog has all these zone five plants in it, as long as there's zone five, they're gonna survive for you. That's a huge mis uh, per uh, perception and it gets a lot of us in trouble. Now, take a look here. I hope you, if you can see my arrow, notice when we're talking zones, how the, that one particular zone stretches all the way across the country. Well, it should occur to you that not every single area of the country is the same. So how can, just simply because it's a zone five plant, how does that mean it's going to survive in all those conditions? And in truth, they don't. So here's an example that I like to use. For 25 years, I lived in Madison, Wisconsin. Madison, Wisconsin is considered pretty much the same zone five as I'm living in right now in Ames, Iowa. So it, you have a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about, whether it's Ames or Madison. Um, interestingly, when I moved out to Iowa, a lot of people asked me, you know, are there any differences? It's only 300 miles in between. Well, indeed, there were differences in gardening. Uh, the single biggest one was that I deal with a lot more wind here in Iowa than I ever did in Madison. That affects some of the plants that I'm going to grow. Um, hemlocks that I could grow very easily in Madison had beautiful specimens. I have simply struggled with um, out here in central Iowa uh, because the wind just desiccates them in the winter. And that's that's sort of the learning thing. 
So that same zone five plant that is growing in Madison is struggling to even live here. Let's use another example. Uh, a woman I used to buy a lot of plants from, she had a specialty nursery. Um, um, the nursery was in Oswego, New York. I'm a native upstate New Yorker, so I understand the state well. She started selling plants that were out of, um, of uh, South Africa. And she said to me, oh, Ed, uh, she was going to come out and speak. And she says, oh, Ed, I've got all these South African plants I'm going to talk about. Your audience will love it. And I said to her, they're not going to survive here. There's no way they're going to go through our winters. And she said what all of you were probably saying. Well, we're zone five and you're zone five. Well, here's where that's so different. Oswego is right on Lake Ontario. Um, so it's in that same area as Buffalo and Watertown that get heavy, heavy snows. Those snows consistently stay on the ground all winter. So here we've already have one difference in that these plants are insulated under that snow cover all winter long. They are the types of plants that will dry out and desiccate if they don't have that snow cover, which we weren't getting consistently in Madison. The other thing is, is these are plants that when they come out of winter, their root systems have to be extremely well drained. That water has to drain away from those plants immediately as the snow melts, which it doesn't do in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, um, Oswego sits on deeply rich alluvial soils, and that meant that the water uh, did drain right away. Let's pick a third location, Denver. I, uh, there are penstemons in Denver I would kill to be able to grow here, and I never will be able to, but there's zone five plants. Well, what's the difference there? Suddenly, we're up at a very high elevation. A lot of the plants that they have there are surviving because they have extremely sharp drainage. Nothing, uh, no water is held around those plants, uh, whether it's winter or summer. So this is something that people need to understand right from the start. Don't base your plant selections simply on zone. Your geographic location, where you are in the Midwest, like I said, even 300 miles uh, the difference between Madison and Ames. All of these things are, are going to affect those plants. So simply because it's a, a zone five uh, doesn't mean that it's going to survive in your garden because you've ignored the rest of its cultural conditions. So here's the big one. And this is one I've really been talking about a lot particularly now with the native plant movement, a very noble movement, but what the folks who are, are, are really pushing uh, on, on this trend, um, they're not giving you all of the education and information that goes with it. So the thought process is that we should be growing native plants and there, there are reasons to do it for insects and, 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 and the, the, um, the ecology. Um, but as far as growing the plants and how they're going to do for you, there's this sort of message that's not spoken that simply because they were native to the area where you live, they're gonna do better than any other plants. Makes sense, right? they're native. However, what nobody's telling you or talking to you about, and you probably don't understand, is native also uh, is talking about um, what we call what was indigenous as far as soils. And what were those uh, climate, what was the climate, um, what, what, what were the conditions at the time that those plants evolved to be native to that site. This is um, a small village, Oregon, Wisconsin, where I lived for 25 years. This is just outside of the town. And this is where we first st start looking at how, uh, as humans, we've modified our soils so tremendously. So this land has been agricultural for hundred, you know, 100 plus years. Uh, the soil structure has been changed from what it was originally. Chemicals have been added, inorganic fertilizers. This soil, 
already is extremely different than what we would have called the native or indigenous soils that native plants would have evolved and adapted to. So to think that we're gonna put those very same plants in these conditions and say they're going to thrive because they were native to that site, we're not acknowledging the fact that those are not the soils that they were native to. Let's go one step further. Now we go ahead and we build our homes on it. And in particular, after the 1950s, oh my goodness, did we change the soil structure of our properties. Where we used to hand dig out um, uh, foundations and we carry the, the subsoils away and not really disturb the rest of the soil around the homes, after the 50s, we went in, we stripped off all the topsoil right from the start. Uh, we uh, not When we pulled out all of that nasty subsoil to create the foundations, they spread that down on our property. Uh, so you've got a whole layer there. And I'm sure many of you have experienced this. And if we were lucky, they brought back in four to six inches of topsoil. And it may not have even been the topsoil they took off in the first place. So now we've gone several generations of modified soils. And, uh, and we're telling you, oh, put in the plants that were native to that, uh, that particular site 200 years ago, when there is nothing there that resembles uh, what those plants adapted to. Uh, and so they could be conditions uh, that, will, that would um, kill those the certain plants that you try to put in. And that's sort of the thing that you're not being told. One thing that really bothers me a great deal, um, and actually it's a friend of mine who did this original drawing, uh, and you've all seen it. We, we're fortunate. We do actually live in a prairie state, but this one is showing up all over Facebook in all parts of the country. And it's again, this sort of backing up that native plants are better because native plants put down deeper roots. Well, let's first talk about the fact that for most of the areas of the country, it says right on here, these are prairie plants. And indeed, it's how prairie plants rooted. So for many people, they, they're in areas where plants evolved with much shallower root systems. So why should they be using this as a comparison when plants that were native to their area would have never produced roots like this in the first place? But even for those of us that are now living in the prairie state, where in the world do you think we have soils like this anymore? The reason those roots were able to go down that deep is it was centuries and centuries and centuries of grassland with grasses dropping, decomposing year after year after year. Soils to that uh, of the original prairies could be 18 inches deep, three feet deep. They were massively deep. That's why they made uh, such good cropland. So yes, indeed, our native prairie plants under native indigenous conditions could put down root systems like this. Who thinks they have this type of condition in their yard? If you do, uh, we, we, we all want to see it because this is not typical. And just because in, um, 200 years ago, they had the ability to put down the roots just because they are a plant that did that. They're going to struggle just as much as any other plant when you're putting them in soil conditions that are clay. Will they have a little better chance? Maybe. Uh, it's going to depend on the species. But this whole philosophy that just because this is what they did as native plants is still true and that they're somehow able to overcome the very same obstacles any other plants we put in the ground, uh, that is complete fallacy. So I hope that makes a little sense to you. Um, and it makes you look at you, your soils in your home landscape a little bit differently. The other thing that's a little bit false about this is I also mentioned that in many areas of the country, plants wouldn't have evolved with that deep root system anyway. So to say all native plants or all a certain group of plants are putting down deep root systems is false. 
also, they're all fibrous root systems. So simply having a good uh, extensive fibrous root system, even going out horizontally, that is perfectly fine. Uh, many plants don't need that depth. So we're trying to lump all of these plants into certain categories that we shouldn't be lumping them in. And when I buy, uh, you, you can see here, um, it's going out wider than it is deep, which is true for most trees, um, but perennials are much the same way. And when I buy plants, this is a clematis, um, I buy plants uh, from places where I know that I'm going to get this really nice extensive fibrous root system. And that might go out to the side uh, just as much as it goes up and down. So keep that in mind. Uh, th that'll be important to these types of gardens. So uh, um, in, in fact, as great uh, demonstration of this, and I'll talk more about these specific gravels, um, this is the gravel garden that we built here at Ryman Garden. Um, I first started doing gravel gardening in Wisconsin. Um, I was involved with a lot of people who did. I built a one of these style gardens um, at the last garden I was at, Allen Centennial Gardens. Those of us who first started, um, the idea was that you um, 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 put down uh, four to six inches of the gravel because most of the pots that we were using when we we're uh, planting uh, were either four and a half inch pots or gallons. So the whole idea was, is when we put the plant down, the bottom of the pot, um, the bottom of the roots were hitting the soil. And we all thought that'll give them the opportunity to put down deep roots. Because again, it, there's that whole thing uh, that roots have to go deep. We found that these types of gardens established themselves very, very quickly. Um, and what we hadn't realized is with no real obstacles uh, and all that uh, pore space in the gravel, no obstruction to roots. So they put out fibrous root systems very, very quickly and horizontally. They didn't really go down that deep. And those horizontal roots were just as uh, effective um, at um, uh, withstanding drought and other conditions. So this whole thing that all roots have to be deep um, is, is actually a fallacy. And many didn't even evolve that way. So that's all I'm going to talk about on soils. Um, but I think for talking about these types of gardens, we have to have at least that uh, much background. Um, I, when I'm asked, uh, and nobody likes soil classes, uh, I joke all the time, if I have a, a lecture that has been canceled due to lack of participation, I'll guarantee you it's probably soils. Um, gardeners, it, it's just not an interesting topic. Uh, it usually comes with terminology that makes your head roll back with your eyes rolled up to the you know, back of the sockets. Uh, it's boring. Um, but everybody should understand soils. They should understand some of these concepts that I'm talking about. So if you don't use any more resources than two books, these are two that I always recommend. Uh, in fact, we've done soil classes here at Ryman where we give the participants teeming with microbes. Read it. Um, they put the, the terminology in, in there in a way that, um, that, the, that gardeners can understand, not soil scientists. And it'll revolutionize the way that you think about soil. And a more recent book, Planting in a Post-Wild World, um, talks about a lot of the new research um, that indicates, uh, talks about uh, planting in existing soils and using less fertilizers and plant communities. And these are the two that I would highly recommend uh, and, and uh, feel if you're not going to read anything else, please read those two. So let's get into the um, type of uh, the water wise gardening. And I'll start, we're talking about a, a specific type, but there are a number of different ways to do this, this particular style using gravel. Um, well, and not always using gravel. Obviously, any type of prairie gardening 
um, has an element of being water wise. Again, if you got the right soils for it, these are the kinds of plants that put down deep roots. They're also the plants that they tended to use in rain gardens. Um, so we already know these plants have a certain resiliency uh, right from the beginning. Another that's becoming quite popular is creating meadows. Uh, for people who want maybe a little more kempt uh, appearance, uh, a little more lawn-like, but uh, definitely not cut short like at the golf course. Uh, this is a fescue meadow at Obert Botanical Gardens in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and it's made up of uh, seven different types of fescues. Uh, that are native to the Midwest. Uh, and this uh, uh, meadow uh, will go through the summer. Uh, if you get drought, it will uh, probably brown up to some degree, but it will survive that. Uh, and again, we're not putting tons and tons of water uh, on something like this, nor chemicals uh, or pesticides. So those are a couple of ways um, that you can do some um, water-wise gardening uh, before we talk about the gravel. Now, these are the gravel-based gardens that we're going to talk about. So it's relatively new in, in some respects. Um, there have been uh, gravel gardens throughout history. I think many people would uh, recognize Beth Chattos, uh, gravel ground um, gravel garden, uh, which was uh, very well known in England. Um, but overall, we didn't here in America, we didn't think much about using gravel. And there is some history uh, that I'm going to tell you about it. One of the gravels you can use is pea gravel. And keep that in mind because the, the Cassian Schmidt uh, type uh, gravel is, is entirely different and harder to obtain. So I'm telling you right now, if you're interested in it, and it's difficult for you to get that gravel. Uh, pea gravel will work. This is, in fact, uh, the Greater Des Moines Botanical Garden and their gravel garden. And you'll see some differences as we go uh, uh, into the other type of gardening. Uh, but this is a rather large, as large as you can get, uh, pea gravel that they've used in uh, this particular setting. Um, and here, without all of the plants flushed out, you can see that, um, and it's a pea gravel uh, that's, you, you don't want pea gravel where every one of the um, um, stones in the pea gravel is perfectly round. Uh, you want one where you've got some variation in that size and structure. That's important because you're trying to create uh, pore space here. So that's pea gravel. Um, this is Chanticleer in um, Wayne, Pennsylvania. Uh, most horticulturalists consider this the most creative garden in the country. They have all kinds of, of different forms of gardens, but this is uh, one of their um, uh, water-wise or xeriscape gardens. I think it's just beautiful. And again, they've used something more akin to pea gravel uh, than the gravel we're going to talk about um, later on. And I think this is a great example because when we think Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, we don't usually think, oh, well, why, you know, why do you have to minimize water? That's a place that has plenty of rainfall and water. We have to be looking at this in all areas of the country. This is not going to be uh, just a, a Southwest issue. And here in Pennsylvania, uh, you have a, a, a Xeriscape garden. Um, this is my friend Dan Benarsik's backyard. Dan is a horticulturist at Chanticleer. And a number of years ago, again, you wouldn't think that this is in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, this is his backyard. And he's actually able to grow uh, some plant materials in here. He'd never otherwise be able to get to flourish uh, because the gravel um, has uh, uh, created drainage. Uh, so those plants survive better in the winter. And again, we're looking more at that sort of pea gravel. 
Um, and then a number of years ago, this is Garfield Park uh, and Conservatory in South Chicago. A lot of people never go outside of the conservatory out back, but there's some wonderful gardens there. Um, and this was probably at least 15 years ago. And this uh, the, the upper mulch level of this entire garden uh, is gravel. And look at the, the beautiful application and design we have here. So I'm going to talk a little more specifically about the Cassian Schmidt inspired garden. These are just starting to take off. Um, in fact, we and I'll show you, uh, it's already been in the New York Times. Uh, it is a style of gardening um, that uh, Cassian Schmidt, um, who is German, uh, came up with. Uh, he's also been involved in other things. He's an alpine plant person. Um, he does uh, many of the same kinds of naturalistic, new American style uh, gardens we call the Dutch Wave that Pete Udolf is also doing. Um, so that's why I put the two of them in there together. Um, but Cassian's the one uh, that came up with this uh, particular style of gravel garden. So when we start talking gravel and we say, oh, you know, you're, you're gardening in gravel, you're going to say, well, what in the world uh, could you grow and how, how what, what would that look like? I want a beautiful garden. This is one of uh, Cassian's um, gardens. And look how lovely. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but once the plants fill in, you don't even know that the, the gravel is there. So compare his design with this one. This one is in uh, near Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. This is Roy Diblick's um, uh, Northwind Perennial Farms. He owns with two other partners. Uh, and he was the one, he went over to Germany. He saw them doing the style of gardening. What, what The reason they started doing it there is they discovered that gardening in this type of, of gravel minimize watering uh, and a lot of maintenance. So where they were using it in a, is in a lot of municipal sites where it took a lot of labor to weed and, and maintain, uh, took all this extra water. Um, so they've been using it uh, in Germany successfully for probably at least 25 years now. So Roy went over, he saw these types of gravel, uh, gardens. He saw Cassian's garden and he came back and he says, I'm going to create one here, see how it does in this country. And this was his first gravel garden at the nursery. Um, and there's Roy, there's the nursery. Um, and uh, he also then started uh, playing around with plant, and, and many of you probably know his name. He's written some very good books, um, but he uh, plants in plant communities. So uh, th here he is talking to one of my groups about how to do that kind of planting. And again, um, here you go, um, uh, the same sort of look, but now we're in a different garden. This is Ulbrich Botanical Gardens uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. There's Roy. Um, Jeff Epping to the right, uh, director of horticulture at Ulbrich for 28 years. In fact, he has, uh, he just retired. His last day was last Friday. Brilliant plantsman, brilliant horticulturist. He got interested in it. Uh, and so the plants I just showed you where he, he put in one of these gardens, they have worked so well for him. He has done a number of them. So let me just show you. Here's one. Look at how gorgeous that is. And the only gravel that you see there um, is the path itself. Oh, and then I'm going to go back to Pete briefly. Pete did actually use this style of gardening in one area specifically, and that was the High Line in New York City. I don't know how many of you have walked it. Um, I've gone through every stage as they've been built. Uh, one of the greatest municipal parks every um, ever built uh, in a uh, major city, but looky, looky here, um, all of these plants, there is very little opportunity to put much substrate, 
uh, in there because it's an elevated rail line. So you can see that this is the rails. There's not much depth to it. Um, and this gravel gardening uh, has made plants survive uh, that would not otherwise. Um, Lori Garden does not make use of, of the gravel, um, but it is a collaboration between Pete and um, um, uh, Roy Diblick. Uh, they both work together on this. Uh, but again, uh, talking about plant materials, there's only 18 inches of soil uh, in Lori Gardens because it's over uh, a parking area. Uh, and again, they, ha they had to really select plants uh, that would take that little depth. And here's an interesting point on the native plants. Um, they intended it'd be all native plants and they discovered a lot of these native plants that couldn't put that depth of root system down failed. So it's actually now a mix because there were plants that weren't native that actually did better than the native plants. Um, so here we are once again, showing you sort of some of the same kinds of flowers you can expect in those gardens. We're going to go back to Jeff. This is his first uh, gravel garden, has matured beautifully over the years. I showed you a second one there. Well, that here's that second one I showed you earlier. Um, then out, this is the, the uh, parking lot and the main entrance up to the building. Here's a place you have to be really careful. This is your first impression of the visitor when they come in. And that's an all entirely all gravel garden all the way around the front entrance. Uh, this is outside of the fence. The, the highway is out a little further here. Uh, this bed was one of those areas outside of the, the, um, the, the interior of the garden. So those kinds of beds uh, don't get taken care of nearly as much, but it's the ones that people see when they drive by. And by converting it over to gravel, um, they've had a much, uh, it's been much easier for them to maintain. And then this is what I call the white garden. And once again, uh, gravel is a substrate there. So you can see how um, successful Jeff thinks this type of gardening is that he's put that many in. Uh, the city of Madison got interested. They said, wow, if this is, uh, you know, the, these are the areas that we find so challenging to keep looking good. Uh, we don't have the resources to put water and fertilizer on them. So they allowed him to start uh, doing some of the parking lot medians. Uh, he's done this in a number of areas around the city of Madison. So it's caught on there as well. And then finally, he put one in uh, uh, and uh, as his front yard um, at his home uh, in, in uh, Madison. This, again, is a gravel garden, and you would never know it uh, the way all of those plants are flourishing the way they are. So it's become popular enough. So you, you saw the High Line has it. You might see it one or two other places, but it's because of Roy Diblick uh, and Jeff Epping, that the most yet you're going to see these styles of gardens right now are in that sort of southern Wisconsin area. Andrew Bunting, who used to be uh, the director of uh, horticulture for Sm Swarthmore College, he's now the director of the Pennsylvania Horticulture Society, um, well-respected horticulturist in the industry, um, he took and he converted his home front yard over to the gravel as well. Now it starts to reach some ears and Margaret Roach did a um, article on uh, both of them and gravel gardening in the New York Times. I found it really interesting, particularly being a horticulturist, the comments and reading down through the comments. Uh, there were a number of them that says, oh, this is interesting. We'd like to know more about how this works. But the number of horticulturists and landscapers that were bashing it and all the reasons it might be uh, bad without knowing anything about it simply amazed me. And I thought, wow, here we are in the industry uh, and, and we're, we're bashing something that we really don't even, uh, we haven't looked far enough to see what it's about. So I was part of the group in Madison that decided to do this as well. I got a grant 
Uh, this was originally a bog in Allen Centennial Gardens, uh, the garden I worked in pr uh, prior to this. Um, this uh, shows you very well uh, what the gravel looked like. Um, and we're get, just getting ready uh, to plant it up uh, in that uh, picture there. Um, the one thing I would highly recommend if you have the opportunity, if you do this kind of garden, I didn't have that luxury. Um, I the, the gravel came all at once and I had to put it all down. And then I used the live students as I could to plant them. It's not that easy to plant in gravel. Um, ideally, the way to do it is get your plants in, place the plants, and then uh, shovel the gravel in around them. Uh, these students weren't particularly happy with me by the end of the day. It was a lot of work. But you can see we planted there. I actually used the opportunity. This back area here was a rain garden because a lot of water came in. This one I called just simply Xeriscape. It was all about uh, simply not putting water on plants. Um, I'm, and then this was another portion uh, that was rain garden as well. So you can use the substrate for a number of different uh, garden styles. And then I had the signs up so the public could interpret it. So I move out here and I'm all excited about this style of gardening. Uh, when I came in, we were just finishing up a master plan and it had this hillside because that's all it was, was a grassy hillside. The design in the new master plan was to have these walls, but it was going to be the hanging gardens of Babylon kind of a look. And I said, one, we've got to start thinking sustainably and show people how they can do sustainable gardening. So fortunately, my staff all got on board with that. And they said, we'll make it a gravel garden. As far as I know, um, it, it's an acre. Uh, and I believe it's the second largest one in the country uh, as a result. Um, here, here we are um, building it and putting the gravel in. Um, as I mentioned, um, you put in um, on top of the soil. And we did put some amended soil on, on top of what you see there. Um, we didn't want plants to try to have to go down in really poor soil. Um, and, and you can see here where we're adding that four to six inches of gravel on top of everything. Uh, this I think I photographed maybe last year. You can see how it's flushing and filling in. And, and again, that whole uh, thought process of, well, I don't want to see the gravel. You don't once it flushes out. So part of the idea here is, um, let me see, I think I probably have, well, that's just more of what it looks like. Um, so part of the philosophy here is that pore space that I've been talking about. The gravel creates, an, um, and, and it's a three-quarter inch or five-eighths inch quartzite gravel. Um, the reason it's quartzite is so it won't break down. Any gravel that breaks down over time creates fines, and you don't want those fines then mixed in. You want to keep these open air spaces. What a lot of people don't realize is the major portion of weeds that we get come in from the air. They might be coming in from the wind, birds, animals, rarely, nowhere near as often are they coming in from the side, like from your lawn. So that's the huge maintenance issue is weed seeds establish. The philosophy here is those pore spaces are so large that when the weed seeds drop, they can't germinate. So what that means is um, you cannot have those plant materials die and drop and just leave them there because then obviously that's going to make future compost uh, for weed seeds to germinate in. So once or twice a year, fall and or spring, you do have to cut back all of the vegetation. And you say, well, there's work. Well, I'll tell you what, doing that once or twice a year is far better uh, than the massive amounts of work of weeding. And those of us who have created these gardens, as long as you keep the, the, the gravel clean around those plants, weeds do not establish. And in fact, once the uh, plants grow up and, and shade the area, uh, that helps even more. 
there's the gravel I was talking about. Like I said, five eighths inch, I think is the size that we use. Um, and you can see with the, the shape of that gravel, the, the tremendous amount of pore space that it creates. And again, it's quartzite, so it won't break down over time. Um, so here again, my students at Allen Centennial, now you can start seeing those plants going in the ground. Uh, one of the things that we learned over time is, uh, we hadn't learned it yet, you'll notice we're planting uh, those containers right straight down in. Uh, today, we would actually do a, quite a bit of root washing uh, and uh, to get a good share of that growing media off, because again, uh, you're getting that in the hole. Uh, and that helps weed seeds to germinate. Um, and as long as you keep it well watered, that first year, you've got to keep a lot of water to it because you're planting in gravel, uh, but they'll take right off and establish well. So our recommendation now is not to put um, a, a lot of that growing meat out with the plant um, in with it. Um, here's one of my volunteers, and we were doing bulbs. Uh, very easy to come in and put bulbs in um, after the fact as well. But again, that gravel is a little harder to get down through than a lot of soils. So uh, back to Old Brick, this is the kind of look you're going to get the first year. There's no way around it. It's going to look like gravel and looks odd. Um, but it, because these plants do establish those fibrous root systems so quickly, and they, the plants themselves grow quickly, you'll be amazed, even in the second year, how much growth, and this is the spring, so you're not even seeing these plants flushed out, um, and then with even uh, three to four years, this is what you end up with. This is glorious. This is beautiful, um, and you've um, minimized uh, a lot of the, the inputs, um, both in labor uh, and in chemicals, water, et cetera. Now, here's the big challenge. And even though I've put two of these in, I keep thinking, well, how practical is this for the home gardener? Because the quartzite gravel is not readily available. In fact, we had, uh, as our sources here in, at Ames, the sources were South Dakota, Missouri, and Wisconsin. So it was only $20 a yard for the gravel, um, but three truckloads of it, which is what we use, was $10,000. It's the trucking that's very expensive. And my thought has always been is if we can get more people interested in it, that's when we can get one of our landscape suppliers to bring in a truckload, and then the, the homeowner can buy from them rather than direct uh, from the source. And for a while, I thought, well, you know, are people even going to impress upon, is, is it enough uh, to impress upon uh, these sites to bring in the gravel? Well, I'm four years into uh, Asian jumping worms. This is my garden. I'm not going to talk much about them. Hopefully, you are all learning about them. Uh, they are now in Iowa. Uh, they are a scourge. There is no uh, way to get rid of them at this point. And in fact, not only are they here, I've heard now they're also already in Kansas. Um, they are moving quickly uh, and they are an issue. And part of the reason that they are such a big issue is because they live in the very upper surface of the soil. What you see there uh, with them is their frass. Uh, those little round balls, um, their poop, so to speak. And they will create over time this thick layer of that on the top surface of the soil. Um, they like it. It helps their living conditions, but it's hydrophobic. It repels water. Plants don't do well in it. Um, so now I'm thinking if, if the um, jumping worms become that much of a problem, one of the solutions could very well be is to use gravel as that um, upper uh, sort of growing media because there's no uh, organic matter in there. There's no way they can create this layer of frass on top. So I'm starting to think now, yes, let's talk a little bit more about these gravel gardens because uh, down the line, they might be part of the solution uh, to the jumping worms. Um, also, I, I could go on and on and on about how discouraging 
Um, I find social media and how far backwards it's taking our education. I, I'm on sites now where old garden myths are coming back as truth. Any gardener out there that's done any gardener at all is suddenly a professional. Uh, they're dispensing advice that is not right. Um, so one of the things I do want to do to help you, as you look up things, whether it's water-wise plants or the style of gardening or anything, make sure that these groups uh, that you're a part of, you're not just taking everything. Somebody says, oh, you know, this worked for me. And you say, well, if it worked for them, um, try to back up what you're being told by authentic research. Social media is taking that away. If you're going to join any group that is dispensing information and answering questions, I highly recommend the Garden Professors blog. All of the people contributing here are professors. They're using real research and up-to-date research. So I strongly encourage you, be very, very careful today where you're getting that information. Uh, and, and, and I love the fact that master gardeners know to use extension. Uh, extension is all backed by research as well.